Okay, everyone. <clears throat> What's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the 10-game uh, main slate that we have here on uh, Tuesday, uh, May 23. Uh, a bunch of arms again um, that we can really play today. Actually, you know, quite a few up in the uh, up in the upper range here uh, of the pricing spectrum over here on DK. Uh, Strider and Cole on the slate again together. Um, so we're going to sp see most of the ownership go to those guys, despite their very expensive price tags and their quite subpar matchups, I would say. Strider gets a Dodgers here. And despite being Strider, um, you know, this is also the Dodgers, right? And Garrett Cole uh, gets Baltimore on the other side. And that's definitely not a... Uh, it's not the most plus matchup of any in baseball either, right? So um, a little bit lower, we have Sonny Gray and you Darvish in far better matchups, I would say. Certainly Sonny Gray with a strikeout matchup against the Giants and you Darvish in a suppression matchup against Washington and a pretty hapless offense over there. Um, now trickling down here in the you know upper 8Ks or so, most guys projecting so far uh, pretty similarly. Um, could I Senga, Mackenzie Gore surprisingly at a very high price tag against San Diego, uh, Eddie Rodriguez, Alex Cobb, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then we get down to the lower range, and as is kind of typical, we got a couple of guys that'll pop a little bit. Um, but mostly some red numbers and, and some lower projections on guys that will probably just want to stay away from. A lot of bad matchups down here, to be quite honest. So I think that's probably going to be a typical construction today. Just landing on two of these guys up top, they're all fine for the most part. And, and then just kind of picking whichever stack you like the best down here at the bottom. Uh, we do have a Major League debut of a very high upside arm down here and Bobby Miller against the Braves. So that is actually our first game. No, it's actually our third game. So um, I lied. We'll get into that when we get there. So some interesting spots that we can pivot to on the mound. Certainly we don't have to eat a lot of this ownership up here on Strider and Cole because of the matchups and because of the price tags. Um, they clearly have the most upside of, of anybody going today, but um, you know, they're, they're priced for it, so um, gonna have to make some decisions there. Decisions there, uh, easy for me to say. So that said, let's just get into it. Baltimore and the Yankees here with Cole. Uh, Kyle Bradish is going for the O's. He's at 7,200, and I'm just kind of lukewarm on this. I don't, I don't really like playing Bradish generally. Um, the stuff isn't all that impressive. It's, it's pretty variant. He's got. Got a decent slider cutter combo that he's working with this season. It's staying down in the strike zone a good bit with the curveball changeup as well. Uh, throwing the two seamer a little bit, mostly to righties, but he's you know mixing it in kind of as a show me a little bit to the left side as well. Um, really not a lot of value. He doesn't throw all that hard. He's got 95 in the tank, so it's not bad. But as we kind of talked about yesterday with. Um, Eddie Cabrera, you need more delta, on, velo delta, on the changeup to your fastball mix. Otherwise, it's not really a changeup. Um, it's basically just a, a you know, a, a third fastball. And that's kind of what we see here with Kyle Bradish, and that's why we don't really get a lot of value out of these uh, out of this mix here. Uh, we do have a short sample, so kind of, you know, noisy in the value metrics still, but um, that's kind of what we've we've always really tended toward here um, with Bradish, and he's got a, a pretty poor fastball mix just in general. That, like I said, the the cutter slider combination is giving him a, a little bit more value. Um, but historically, he's always given up power and more production to the right side. Now that's likely going to kind of fall off a cliff here um, as the slider curveball combination for him is going to suppress a little bit more production from the righties but he'll still get on the barrel a little bit as you see it 
you know, 9% barrel rate. We've got plenty of guys that are higher than that today, but uh, 9% itself over a large sample is is certainly a notable figure. You'd like this uh, quite a bit lower down in the, um, well, as low as you can get it, I suppose. Uh, so that said, the the change up here in, in fastball mix is not all that equitable so far. So in a short sample, we're seeing fine suppression metrics for him, but um, could probably expect those numbers to come up quite a bit. Like I said, he doesn't throw all that hard. And despite having a full five pitches here, um, not a ton of equity in the arsenal for him. So that said, I think we can get to a little bit of the Yankees. Not my favorite here today necessarily because, I mean, they're kind of expensive. I'm not jacked about these prices. Um, you know, second base is pretty weak today, I think, on my first look. Uh, I think Glaber is probably okay um, up there with Altuve. Those are probably your, your best spend-up options, I would assume. Uh, you can always play Judge and, and Rizzo, of course, but Rizzo at 4900 is kind of a stiff price tag for him in general because he walks so much. And as I mentioned, generally we want to go after Bradish with some righties uh, historically. So um, that said, he's not it's not like he's not attackable at all with left-handers, and, and Rizzo hits righties just fine. And this is a Yankee stadium, so if you're sure if you're playing Yankee stacks, certainly play Rizzo as well. Um Everybody else kind of is cheap enough to make those couple got those three guys happen, right? DJ 39, Bader 39, his price come up a little bit. Jake Bowers finally up to 2100. So, um Volpe down in the 7 at 4000, not super excited about that. So, kind of a goofy stack here to make with the Yankees. Um not all that excited, but that said, like I don't really want to play Bradish either. Um with Cole, I'm not super worried about anything fundamentally. Of course, we never really are the the suppression and the strikeout metrics. This is all fine. He does have a, a 2.0 ERA with expected hovering about a, a run and a half higher. Um, so if we're going to see some regression for him, it's likely to come in the strand rate. If anybody does get on base, then that's probably where it's going to come. It'll just allow those guys to come around and score. And you'd see that, uh, that realized ERA float up a little bit uh but overall the whip is is great as it always has been with cole um he's really dialed down the homer issues that he's seen in the past this season uh but once again this is at yankee stadium and this is a good offense over here in baltimore i i really don't like stacking against cole and going out of my way uh, but you can get a little bit of leverage here there's a, still a very high upside offense and when cole is bad he could be really bad and it you take a lot of risk when you eat 11-2 and 40% ownership on the guy. Um, if you're just building teams and, and scripting a bunch of stuff in Saversim, then you're going to get a lot of both he and Strider here. So you'll have to balance that uh, with your preferred lineup constructions later, um, or with offenses that we'll get to later, that is. So there's nothing wrong fundamentally here. Uh, the arsenal all looks pretty good. Um, and, and this is Garrett Cole. We know he has upside for 40 points every time he takes the mound, but once again, this is a pretty difficult matchup. Uh, just a 22% aggregate K rate for the O's this season against right-handers. Uh, pretty sticky, not going to hit for a whole lot of average, but 250 is not nothing as an aggregate, and they'll get the baseball in the air and on a line here a little bit, so... Uh, with 32% aggregate hard contact against righties, that's, it's okay. Now, of course, Cole is, is a well above average righty, so like I said, don't want to go out of my way to stack against him. Um, but if you want to take some short pieces of some guys at playable price tags uh, for the O's, I think that's okay. Cedric at 57, it's pretty aggressive. Same thing with Rutch at 51, also pretty aggressive. Anthony Santander at 44, he's a yeah, he's okay. I'm kind of lukewarm on that. Best price adjusted play would probably be like an Adam Frazier or something. He's at 2800. Um, don't really want to play Gunner here at 4000. So I, I do like Cole for sure. It's just a uh, you know 11 two when we get up into these into these price tags for him. Um, similar to like a Luis Castillo. When you get up to these high price tags, uh, we start getting priced out. The upside starts getting priced out. We need. We need him to pop for north of 30 a very large percentage of the time when we eat this kind of ownership. 
and it just doesn't happen all that regularly, despite you know our our biases and um, how much, however much we'd like to think so. Uh, so that said, he's fine. Some correlated short Yankees pieces I think are fine as well, targeting some Kyle Bradish here. But overall, just kind of an uh, underwhelming game. I would expect Cole to run pretty decently here and go a full six. But, I mean, north of that is probably, I don't know, it's not off the table, but uh, probably pretty um, less likely, I would say, than, than in other matchups. Baltimore's good offense. Okay, let's move on to San Diego and the Nationals. We have you Darvish on the mound for going for the pods. Uh, 10-5. Man, the Padres have been bad. Uh, this, this is the whole season. This this team just underperformed. It's pretty frustrating. Um, and really, Darvish has been kind of a, a white light for him. Uh, he's always good, and this is Darvish. We don't really have anything to worry about necessarily in the, in the fundamental arsenal either. Um, we can't take nearly anything out of these numbers here uh just 48 innings and he throws so many pitches that um you know you only get what 12 15 pitches outside of the slider of any one in any particular start so very hard through just eight starts to get a a, a large value sample on him uh but throwing the slider a lot that's really where he establishes um but spreads it out pretty well with the fastballs as well. And he's got some off speed and he mixes in this curveball also. Um, he'll give up some pop every once in a while. Realized ISOs this season, 159 and 186 to lefties and righties. Giving up a little bit more average to the lefties. But nothing terribly worrisome here. Uh, control numbers, perhaps a little bit inflated here against the left-handers. But he's always been very good against the right side of the plate. Giving up a little bit of hard contact so far, and just a 58.5% strike one rate, but he throws so many pitches that um, he throws them in every count as well. So it's not a as big a worry for a guy like Darvish um, compared to like the rest of the league. But uh, we'd like to see a little bit more chase out of him, of course, um, and this number will probably come up a little bit. As, uh, as we get a larger sample on him. But the swing strike stuff, CSW, it's, it's all fine. Suppression metrics, right about where he should be. 3.5 ERA, ERA with expected metrics in the same range. Strand rate looks fine as well. So all good here on Darvish as well. And this is a pretty good matchup, of course, against uh, Washington. They just don't hit for any power whatsoever. 81 WRC plus against righties this season. 107 ISO. This isn't going to come up. Uh, they just don't have anybody to hit the baseball over the wall. Maybe a Corey Dickerson will help them out a little bit in that department. Perhaps Joey Manessis, when he gets going a little bit more, um, might help as well. But for the most part, this is kind of going to be where they are for the rest of the season. And despite some slightly elevated 33% hard contact, they, most of this is on the ground. This is the highest ground ball to fly ball ratio that we've got for anybody going on the slate today. And I like Darvish. Uh, I think he's going to, I mean, as of right now, we are, we're only seeing 11% ownership on the guy. And from a suppression and upside combination standpoint, um, due to the matchup here, I think he's probably the best play above 10,000, right up there with Sonny Gray, um, considering the matchups. So I like Darvish a pretty good bit here. I think this is a very attainable uh, price tag for him given everybody else on the slate and, and how many teams we can we can go play in a batter's box. And I like the ownership as well. Mackenzie Gore, I'm not super crazy about this particular matchup, nor the price tag on him. Um, he's been very good this season, of course, right? Where I think we're finally starting to see the Mackenzie Gore breakout. Last few starts, though, he struggled a little bit, and he's been kind of spraying it. Walks are still there a little bit for him. Um, he's got an 11.5% aggregate walk rate this season. Staying off the barrel, though, and staying mostly down in the strike zone. So he's getting ground balls, and when he does walk people, he is stranding them because he's, he's getting out of innings here. And as we can see, if we're going to see some any type of regression, um, it's probably going to come in the strand rate. Now, an 80% rate is sustainable, or close to this, uh, longer term with guys that can stay down in the strike zone like this, you can get away with a slightly higher walk rate and not give up a whole hell of a lot of production 
if your ground ball rate stays high. Now, if we start to tick down a little bit, of course, this is super noisy against lefties. He'll he'll be good against lefties with the four-seamer slider and the curveball as well. He'll stay down in the strike zone there. But with the lack of a changeup, he might float it a little bit and come up in the strike zone against opposite-handed hitters. So we got to keep an eye on that, and we do see that the ground ball to fly ball ratio in a far larger sample is down much closer to neutral at a buck twenty-five. So uh, we have to keep an eye on this for Mackenzie Gore, but for the most part, everything is fine. He's throwing strikes. He's got good chase. The swinging strike rate is ticked up now to north of twelve and a half percent. It's very strong. We'd like to see a little bit more called strikes out of him. And that would push the CSW north of 30, but we're okay. And for the most part, he's staying off the barrel. So any hard contact woes are really not there. Not inducing enough soft contact so far, but, it, I mean, to the right side, north of 20% soft contact is an elite figure. Um, against the lefties, like I said, this is a very short sample here, and these numbers will balance out quite a bit more. But overall, like I said, we're, I think we're seeing a breakout from Mackenzie Gore. Um, however, pretty difficult matchup 22 percent aggregate k rate for the padres against lefties this year 177 iso they're still going to hit for a little bit of power and get the baseball in the air here with an 095 ground ball to fly ball but not a lot of hard contact so we'd like to see this quite a bit higher 26 percent is is quite low now we do have a shorter sample just 575 pas against lefties for the pods this season but 26 percent is, is notably low um, they're popping some balls up and, and making a lot of soft and, and medium type of contact here. So that's why they've been really so underwhelming. And as we can see, they're five games under 500. This lineup should be a hell of a lot better than it than it's really shown so far. So um, I think Mackenzie Gore is OK in tournaments, to be quite honest. He's he's coming in, you know, six percent ownership right now. I think this is fine. I don't like the price tag and I don't like the raw strikeout matchup, uh, but the pods are still missing. Uh, Manny Machado, and they're probably going to filter like a Hassan Kim up to the two hole. He's a better contact hitter um, than Machado, that is. And, but down at the bottom of the lineup, there's some strikeouts that they can go after here. And I, I think it's an okay play here. Uh, Tatis, Kim, Bogarts, Juan Soto, going to be difficult to get through for sure. Uh, but I think this is okay in deeper tournament stuff. I don't think you land on this in in single entry three max or maybe not even 20 max given the other arms that we have available but i think this is okay i i'm not excited about the price tag um but i think there's upside hidden in this arsenal like i said i think we're seeing a breakout here so uh, i think both pitchers are, are very well in play here i'm not in, encouraged um or really like thrilled about playing any offense whatsoever uh certainly not the nationals because they stink um you know, maybe a couple of Padres pieces, but, like, they're very expensive, too. So I'm not sure I want to go there either. Mostly just pitching here. Okay, here's Bobby Miller for the Dodgers. He's making his debut. Big, big arm here coming up. Um, he's got four-plus pitches, and he runs the four-seam fastball up into the triple digits. He, he sits upper 90s, and he's got killer velo here. He's got a very hard slider in the upper 80s and low 90s as well throws change up and a curveball too uh, curveball probably fourth on the list in terms of equitable pitches for him so it's four seamer slider is probably the number two then the change in the curveball but he's got four that he can work with here and they're all plus um, so as is natural with any young arm uh, we can attack variants that we're going to see with any of these young arms but um, of the three young guys that uh, that the Dodgers have brought up this season, I'd say Bobby Miller probably has the most upside, uh, at least in my opinion, of any of them. So, like this arm a lot, and at 5200 I think is a very playable price tag here. If you need to get down to this, uh, I think there's upside here for 20 and even 25 points in this particular matchup. Um as we talked about a little bit yesterday, the Braves aren't going to hit for a lot of average here. And if they're not hitting the baseball over the wall, it's difficult for them to create runs. We saw the guy, the only guy that creates runs for him, Acuna, like he stole third base on a walk last night. So, um, like, he's the only one that's doing anything at the top of the lineup. And 
if these guys are not hitting it out of the ballpark, um, it's difficult for full stacks to get there. Now, they, of course, have all the upside in the world, and they, once again, even in full stacks, they still put up, whatever, seven or eight runs last night. You know, so all of these guys have plenty of upside individually to get there, but as a full stack, it makes them harder to play. Uh, you can always attack a young arm, and and that's perfectly fine with one of the most potent offenses in baseball. Don't think this is bad, and we could still attack some of the Dodgers bullpen over here that's been susceptible all season. Um, I think that's fine. I'd probably side with Bobby Miller here if I had to choose. Um, now, the price tags on the on the Braves are starting to come down a little bit. Matt Olson's still at 53. Kind of hard to get to that when he strikes out so freaking much. Or at least it seems like it does. Um, Sean Murphy's still kind of expensive, 49 there. Austin Riley coming down. He's 4,800 now. Been a little bit cold recently. Cunha's still 65, but uh, you're going to pay that for him every game um, all season long. And Ozzy Albee's still kind of expensive. We want him a little bit more from the right side than the left side. He's been really struggling from the left side this season. Uh, he's at 4,600, so not great there. There's cheaper pieces, of course, down at the bottom of the lineup if you want to mix in Brave stacks and target this young arm. But I think at this particular price tag, I think there's enough upside here. Uh, and he's popping for a full 10 points. It's not like this is a seven-point median projection for a guy. Like, this guy's got a lot of velo. He has a lot of upside here and four-plus pitches that he can go to work with. So uh, I think this is a very attackable spot. Uh, and we've actually seen the Braves run total. It was north of five pretty much all night since he opened last night. And it's been whacked here this morning. It's down to about uh, 4.7, 4.8 here. So down through the five, and that's a, a kind of a significant move. So I think Bobby Miller's in play. Strider on the mound, of course, he's in play too, 12-3. But again, it's it's ownership in the matchup that we got to eat here. Um, he... Like, there's nothing wrong fundamentally, as we've talked about a couple of times with Strider. Like, all of these numbers are just out of control off the charts. 70% strike one is incredible with this kind of strikeout stuff. 41.5% K rate. The control is there. That's really the only thing that kind of um, troubles him sometimes, and it did in his last start. Didn't have his best command. I mean, still struck out seven in, in five innings or whatever, uh, but walked three and ended up giving up four runs against Texas. So that type of performance is in the tank here for Strider and certainly in this matchup against the Dodgers. Of course, they walk at an 11% clip here and strike out in aggregate just at a, a 23% clip uh, against right-handers. Still make a lot of hard contact, still hit for a lot of power, of course, and, and hit it in the air and on a line. So um, this is a very difficult matchup for Strider. Not to say that he can't get there um, in his one start against uh, against the Dodgers. It was middle of the summer, about this time last year. He went six innings, didn't give up any production whatsoever, struck out seven, and sprayed just five hits against them. So... Um, you know, the upside is there for 25 and 30 points, of course, even in a very difficult matchup for him because his stuff is so good. Throwing the change up a little bit more, we're starting to see him trust this pitch more and tick up above this 5% little threshold here. But he's still just a four-seamer slider guy, and that will allow the Dodgers to kind of zero in on what he's throwing. Not, not to say they're going to be able to hit it, right, because the chase rate is huge. Strike one rate, as we as we mentioned, and the swinging strikes at 20%. Are, it's just out of control. So there's nothing worrisome, of course. You just got to balance the full 12-3 price tag and the heavy, heavy ownership here at 45, pushing 50%. Um, on 12-game slates, I think there are other guys. Like, there's six, eight other pitchers we could probably consider playing today. You don't have to go to this. Uh, he very clearly has 50-point upside every time he takes the mound. Um, and even in a difficult matchup. So you can balance, you know, a, a high upside offense and fade some strider here, or at least come in underweight to this if you're building a bunch of teams. Um, you, know, you don't have to play this at this particular price tag today. Doesn't mean he's a bad play, of course. 
Okay, let's move on to Houston and the Brewers. Houston finally got there last night. We talked about that a little bit. Um, they're they're bound to break out, man. And sure enough, it all it requires is Jordan Alvarez getting off the schneid a little bit. He hit two bombs last night. And you probably weren't winning tournaments if you didn't have him. So, um, JP France is going for the Strohs today. And it, I kind of like the, the the Strohs again here. Not necessarily JP France. He's still kind of expensive for me. Um, I think this matchup is all right. We talked about his last outing. We might be able to get to him a little bit with the Cubs. And sure enough, he gave up, um, what, six runs, I believe, and, and got beat up, beat up pretty good. Yeah, sprayed nine hits, walked two guys, just struck out two and three and two-thirds against Chicago. Um, Chicago's offense is a little bit more potent than the Brewers, even though they're cooling off a little. Uh, I really don't like playing the Brewers, <laughs> to be quite honest. This offense is super underwhelming. Uh, they're just average in literally every single metric. And... They're, walk, they're not walking nearly as much as they were to start the season. So this is ticked down a four, full uh, a full 4% rather, um, in the last probably month. Uh, we knew that was going to correct from the 13 and 14% that they were displaying earlier in the season, but um, you know that's it's corrected quite hard quite quickly. So their offense over the last little while has been very, very frustrating to watch. Um, and now that Yelich is kind of dealing with the back issues again, the he's not going to run nearly as much as he has been unless he's feeling good. And he still hits a lot of ground balls. So um, difficult for this lineup to really get going. They've got a, lo- a bunch of young hitters still down at the bottom of the lineup. And a lot of guys without uh, a whole lot of upside. Um, some guys that are struggling. One guy that they refuse to take out of the two-hole. Uh, in Jesse Winker, but he has been terrible, <laughs> you know. So uh, they're even pinch hitting for him every time they bring in a lefty later on in the in the game. So um, very hard to stack the Brewers because they're, there's just not a lot of upside there for them anymore. So despite wanting to kind of target J.P. France and go after him a little bit, he's a young arm too, but there's still a lot of variance with him. And he's pitching to a lot of contact here so far, 78%. But just a 15% aggregate K rate, just three starts. But this number is going to start to converge a little bit. He he just has no chase in him and a sub 10% swinging strike rate as of right now. I'd like to play him at, at cheaper price tags in decent matchups like this against the Brewers. But 7,700, I'm not really thrilled with going after this. Um, so I think despite my my bearishness on the Brewers and their offense in general, I think you could you could consider. Getting to some Brewers pieces today, Yelich is just 4,500, and as long as the back is good, he has been moving a little bit and running on the base paths, and he's hit a few balls over the wall. So the power is starting to return if he is healthy. Um, Willie Adamas still cheap. Willie Contreras behind the plate, very playable catcher piece as well. Rowdy Telez always playable at first base, 4,100 against right-handers. Um, like I said, hard to play Jesse Winker in the two at 28, despite the price tag. He Sometimes he only gets two ABs, um, and they just sit him because he stinks. So not my favorite to get to full stacks here with the Brewers, but I think this is an attackable spot here against J.P. France. He's pitching to too much contact with no chase here, and it's really the Brewers' main weakness. It's striking out and, and not being able to put the baseball in play. So I think you could play a little bit of, of Milwaukee and target some JP France. Don't really like this price tag for him. Uh, Colin Ray on the mound for the Brewers, 7,000. Um, I'm not going to be doing this either. Sub 20% strikeout rate, and I don't want to be going after Houston. Um, I really, we've talked about this for like the last week or so. I think they're about to really start to heat up. And yesterday was, I mean, it could very well be noise, right? When you put up 12 runs, you don't, you're certainly not going to do that every game. Um, but that typically suggests a, a breakout for an offense when everybody starts seeing the baseball and they all start clicking. Uh, we've seen it with like the Cardinals, for example. When everybody starts going, it just it brings a, a whole different level of confidence to the club ha- clubhouse, and everybody starts seeing it and everybody starts hitting. So uh, I think Houston may very well be approaching that now that they've got Altuve back, even though he didn't start last night. Mo Debone hit a bomb. 
you know. So it's even your very low power hitter is hitting the ball over the wall. So um, that's kind of what you can see here with Houston. This is still a very dangerous offense and a real good baseball team over here. I don't want to play Colin Ray at 7,000. I don't think the strikeout stuff is going to be there, and, and the run suppression also unlikely to be there. So I think you can get to some Houston again. Um, now, they're coming in pretty high in, in value scores so far today, uh, less so in the ownership because we're seeing a lot come to uh, Coors Field, as we'll get to. But um, I think you can still get to Houston. You can play every single one of them. They're still at, at very playable price tags. Josie Abreu with another couple of hits last night, I think. So com coming out of his uh, early season hibernation, uh, as it were, is is Josie in the middle of the lineup. Um, Jeremy Pena, still very frustrating that he's 4,900. Uh, he needs to be down at like the 42 range, but um, playable in stacks are really all of these guys. Jose Altuve, having just gotten a day off last night, should be back today. So uh, like Houston and like the Brewers a little bit, really just no pitching here, I don't think, for me. Okay, San Francisco and the Twins. Let's try and speed this up a little bit. Um, Alex Cobb on the mound. I think the price tag's okay here at 8300 Projection is fine. Ownership seems fine. Um, the strikeout stuff, however, this season has kind of dropped off a cliff. He was displaying 24% really to both sides of the plate last season, and that has been chopped in half against the left side of the plate. Just 12.5% to lefties this year. 298 average allowed with a 325 Woba. That's a fine number, but a lot of average here. No power because he's still got the very high ground ball rate to really both sides of the plate. We're not super worried about elevated hard contact rates when the baseball's on the ground this much. Um, but we are going to note that uh, we're, we're only seeing a 12.5% strikeout rate here. He's just not getting the swing and miss on the curveball and the split combination to the lefties so far this year. And this is a full nine starts now, 51 innings. You know, just 22 and two-thirds against lefties, 105 hitters. But um, we need to see this number tick up a little bit against the left side of the plate in order to get really jacked about playing Alex Cobb. We want him mostly this season against very right-handed heavy lineups because, it, once again, like the, the ground ball rate is still very high two and three quarters to one here. He stays off of the line, and he's got a 28% K rate to the right side. Overall, the expected batted ball metrics are are fine. 262 XBA with a 312 X Woba and a 140 X ISO. This is, these are fine numbers here, and he's really very rarely going to give up homers and get picked apart unless he's floating this two-seamer uh, really to both sides of the plate, and he's not getting any whiffs on the split so that's really how the righties can get to him if he's starting to float the two seamer the ground balls will turn into a lot more line drives and then you know that's when guys can start circling the base paths so we really want lefty heavy teams twins can do that a little bit um but i'm not sure i really want to be stacking against them even with guys like a joey gallo alex kirilov and a trevor larnick from the left side eddie julian who knows if rocco's gonna freaking pinch hit for him um, again, before he even gets in at bat. So uh, that was mega frustrating last night for sure. Uh, in any case, I don't really want to stack the Twins here. I don't like stacking against Alex Cobb. It's just very hard to um, put together real serious innings against and put up big crooked numbers because he's got such a high ground ball rate. So I think that puts him in play against very righty-heavy lineups. Now, the Twins are unlikely to just stack all of their righties tonight. So they're going to have their lefties in there, which kind of takes me off Alex Cobb a little bit. He'll be able to make a little bit more contact. And it does put a guy like a Joey Gallo, mega, mega fly ball hitter, in play a little bit. Same with a Kirilov and a Trevor Larnick. Um, Trevor Larnick probably not because he's going to he's gonna struggle quite a bit here with the splitter tonight. So if I were going to get to a couple of the twins, it would probably be just one-offs, maybe a cheap Eddie Julian or something like that. But um, I think Alex Cobb's in play. Depending on, on the Twins lineup, it may put me on to him a little bit more. It may take me off. Sonny Gray on the mound for Minnesota, 10-6. Um, I think this is fine, too, going after the Giants here. Giants may have lost another one of their left-handed bats last night in Lamont Wade. He jammed his thumb, I believe, and he came out late in the game 
Um, so they may just try to, you know, get him off his feet and, and check him out a little bit, make sure he didn't make anything worse. Um, so we'll see if they have him in the lineup tonight. In the event that he is not in the lineup, we're seeing the same kind of split here, strikeout split at least, for Sonny Gray that we see with Alex Cobb. So in the event that Lamont Wade is out tonight and they – and they throw in another righty there, they may very well put in five or even six right-handers in this lineup against Sonny tonight just because of a lack of bodies. Um, if that's the case, then I really like Sonny Gray. And now historically, his strikeout stuff has been better to the left side. But since he's introduced this cutter a little bit, he's getting far less swing and miss and far more ground balls and, and soft contact to the left side. So... We're encouraged, of course, in the shorter sample here for Sonny Gray that the ground ball rate to lefties is so high. He's not going to give up any power to them um, with the slider curveball cutter combination. He's He's got the two-seamer and, and the change as well and establishing with the four-seamer a little bit. So this, this whole arsenal, I, I absolutely love it. And the changes that he's made this season, really spreading everything out. We should throw the fastball mix a little bit more, but it's okay here. Um... So I really like everything that's going on with Sonny, and I think there's a very attackable spot against the Giants. They're going to strike out a 25% clip against righties. And that's with all of their lefties in the lineup. So um, if they're righty heavy tonight, I, th I think getting to Sonny Gray at reduced ownership compared to Strider and Cole is very warranted as well. Uh, not super interested in playing pretty much any of the Giants. Uh, I think there's probably better spots that we could attack offensively than going after one of the best arms here. Okay, Mets and Chicago. Uh, Kodai Senga on the mound and Drew Smiley for the Cubs. 9,400 for Kodai Senga. Now, I hate this walk rate, man. I just, I don't think he solved it. Like, sure, he struck out 12 Rays in his last start, but he still walked three guys, you know, and it, this has been every single start here. He's only going five and a third every outing. It's because he's elevating the pitch count. He's still throwing 100 pitches. He's very similar to Blake Snell. And, and other guys that just have major walk problems. Like, yeah, you've got strikeout stuff. That's excellent. But if you only last five innings every start, it makes it super difficult for me to play you at an elevated price tag um, you know, because you, you spike your own variance, and it makes it really hard for me to want to take financial risk with you. Um, that said, I, I think he's starting to get a little bit more comfortable here. Um we, we know the strikeout stuff when he's got the splitter really going it is absolutely there, right? It's 30% to both sides of the plate here. He's not going to give up a lot of power. It's just the walk rate and spiking the pitch count that I'm worried about with him. Now, this is a fine matchup. They're missing Cody Bellinger or the Cubs. They do have Nico back and, and healthy at the top of the lineup, but Dansby will strike out. Ian Happ will strike out a little bit. Say Suzuki less so, but... They've got now Mike Talkman that they're filling the Cody Bellinger hole with, um, who is, is shown flashes with the Rockies, shown flashes with the Yankees, but overall kind of a, a journeyman here. And they've got him kind of in the five hole. Um, he's a fine 2100 outfield piece punt if you if you want to try and capitalize on some of this walk variance with Kodai Senga. I think that's okay. He's still throwing strikes. It's just the chase rate. And, and very high walk rate that are uh, really underwhelming here so far. So I'm yeah, really just kind of still lukewarm. Now, I like the price tag a little bit better. He's not north of 10K. And we've got uh, several other guys that are really not in the greatest matchups. I'd rather just get up to Darvish, rather just get up to Sonny Gray, rather than you know play a Kodai Senga here with a 14% walk rate over eight starts. But I think this is in play here at lower ownership. That's how we want to attack. You can really capitalize on variance when when the ownership comes in pretty low. Now, at 15% or so, it's it's probably about value. So I'm not sure that's necessarily super exploitable. Uh, but this is an okay matchup here. The Cubs have really, really cooled off since their early season barrage. So uh, I think it's an okay play here. And I think correlated stacks with the Mets are fine as well because I'm still looking to go after Drew Smiley. Um, this pitch, this two-seamer that he's throwing a full 43% of the time, you cannot sustain a, a fly ball mix here, a fly ball lean, 
throwing a two-seamer. You just cannot do it because it's a bad, bad pitch to opposite-handed hitters. And when you float this and when you induce fly balls with this pitch, they're eventually going to go over the wall. And that's why the two-seamer has been largely phased out over the last several seasons by most elite starting pitchers. Um, for example, Garrett Cole, he didn't throw the two-seamer all that much anymore. He throws a four-seamer now, right? So this is a really hard pitch and a really hard arsenal to get there with Drew Smiley. This is why I'm so bearish on the damn guy. He's got an ERA south of three, but an XFIP about a run and a half higher. He's got an 095 whip. He's not walking people, and he's throwing strikes and staying off of the barrel, which is very strong. And that generally, you know, those metrics suggest that it's very hard to stack against him. And he's a fly ball lean here, but um, this break-even sinker value, and really that's it. He's a two-pitch guy here. He's only thrown to cutter about 8%. 50% of this curveball so far this season, um, this is not, like, you need more than just two pitches to survive when only one of the pitches is providing you a lot of value. Like, Strider only has the, the four-seamer and the slider, but he shows a little bit of the change. And those two pitches for him, four-seamer and slider, are elite. Drew Smiley doesn't have a freaking, whatever, 20% swinging strike rate and a 40% K rate. You know, it's... So it's quite a, you know, a significant drop-off if, if we're comping, you know, two-pitch arsenals between pitchers here. So I still want to go after Drew Smiley, and that kind of puts me onto the Mets here a little bit, even though they're like a just a super frustrating kind of garbage offense, really, to play in DFS. Just super average and very unimpressive all the way around. They don't make hard contact. They don't hit for power. They don't strike out, but they're just like, blech. Uh, pretty much all the way around. Outside of Pete Alonzo, even Frankie Lindor is not hitting the baseball over the wall a hell of a lot this season. Every other guy is just a contact hitter that's going to walk a lot and hope Petey hits it over, you, you know, into the into the baskets at, at Wrigley. So um, not all that thrilling to play the Mets on, on full 10 or 12 games or whatever we got here, but I think it's okay today. Uh, a lot of the matchups here, since we've got so many good pitchers, are are kind of bad, to be quite honest. So I think going after Drew Smiley, I think is a very vulnerable pitch here. Um, Cutter's been fine at 8%, and that'll induce a little bit of soft contact to the right-handers, sure, as we can see here, a full 26.5%. These are good numbers so far, so we can't deny this. 217 XBA with a 265 X Woba and a 118 X ISO. These are elite numbers, and he's still got some strikeout stuff there. Um, bad strikeout matchup for him, so I think with the vulnerability in this two seamer here, I'd rather just take shots in the Mets. But don't you know? Don't get me wrong. This is not a thrilling team to stack. They are very, very frustrating to go after and play a lot of. Uh, their price tags, however, are making it pretty attractive here. So I think it's you could play you could play some Smiley. Um, not a good strikeout matchup for him, but the suppression metrics are good, and this offense is really just kind of bad. So it's okay. Um, really kind of lukewarm on the game overall, and the betting markets are too, projecting just, you know, about four runs for, for both of these guys here. So not super interested in really much of anything, but I think a lot of stuff is really in play here. Uh, Eddie Rodriguez on the mound for the Tigers, 8,800 for him against the Royals. Uh, I think this is playable here. Now, it's still an elevated price, um, but kind of fishy in that, you know, we we're paying mid 6Ks and 7Ks for him. And then, unfortunately, we didn't get the chance to stack against him when he finally had a, a rough outing. And that was his last start. He got Pittsburgh, and they got to him a little bit. Um, however, he's been fantastic in, what, five of his last six starts have all been really, really good. Going very deep into games here. And the strikeout stuff is, is there. So um, it's been mostly to the right side of the plate. Not seeing a lot of lefties. But the arsenal here with the four-seamer cutter change mix is keeping him really down in the strike zone, certainly to the left side in a short sample. Giving him a little bit of a fly ball lean uh, with this cutter, kind of curious here, but inducing a decent bit of soft contact really to both sides, 19% soft there, and no hard contact. 
about 25% or better, really, to either side. So expected metrics are great for Eddie here. He's throwing a lot of strikes. He's not walking people. He's staying off the barrel here. 219 XBA with 266 X Woba and a 123 X ISO to both sides with an aggregate 25% K or 24% K rate here. Uh, I think it's all pretty good. And I think it's a fine suppression spot going after the Royals. That said, they make a lot of hard contact here. And we're going to talk about that a lot in this game, as a matter of fact. So 34.5%. This is the second highest split adjusted number on the day. It's a short sample here for the Royals against lefties, just 420 PAs this year. But they strike out far, far less against lefties than they do against righties. 075 ground ball to fly ball with some hard contact. And a lower strikeout rate with a slightly elevated walk rate here, pushing 9%. This is okay against lefties, 181 ISO. This is sneaky decent. These are like pushing Boston figures, uh, to be quite honest, um, against uh, against righties, for example. So these are, are decent numbers for, for the Royals against lefties. I think you could consider playing a couple of these pieces, Bobby Witt, and a Salvi Perez, certainly you can play these guys. They're obviously the highest upside right-handed hitters, but you can mix in a Michael Garcia as a cheap third and short shortstop piece at 2,500. That's fine. Eddie Olivares, still 3,000. They'll probably have him in the, in the two-hole today um, in the outfield. That's a fine play as well. You can always play Vinny against both righties and lefties, and you can play MJ against lefties as well. He hits lefties fine. So, uh, I think it's an intriguing Royal stack really off the board here going after Eddie. Not my favorite because I do respect Eddie and I do think the changes that he's made this year, um, increasing the strike. This is the old Eddie and very nice to see him healthy again and, and really performing very well. Uh, but I think you can play both sides here. I think Eddie's in play for sure. And as is, you know, as are some Royal stacks, I suppose. Um, Daniel Lynch likely to be going for the Royals here today. He's 6,400. He's coming off a rotator cuff strain. Um, so that's why he's been out all season. Now, last year, uh, let's just pull up his his numbers for the last couple of seasons. Um, made his debut in 2021. And has really given up a lot of hard contact to the right side. He's... He's in. He's pretty elevated. He's got a 360 lifetime WOBA against righties with a about a 460 xFIP, sub 20% strikeout rate really to both sides, 20% each, and a walk rate pushing nine and 10% to both sides as well. The hard contact is really where he gets kind of picked apart, mostly by right-handers in the opposite side of the platoon at a 38% aggregate rate here. And he's about a neutral ground ball to fly ball. So he's very attackable. He's four seamer slider curveball mostly. Lack of a change, lack of a good change. Gives him a, uh, some susceptibility against the right side of the plate. So um, we can attack this here for sure. He's had some pretty rough rehab outings. So it doesn't look like he's fully feeling it just yet. Um, you know, despite ready to jump back into the rotation. If it is him, they haven't announced anybody officially just yet, but by most accounts, um, this is where he is in his rehab and and where they are kind of in the rotation. So um, it's likely going to be him. I don't think we can play him here at 6,400, even against the hapless Tigers. They're not all that hapless in terms of hard contact. 37.5%. This is like four ticks higher, three ticks higher than everybody else on the day. I, like I said, I think the Royals are the second highest split adjusted. So... 37.5% is a huge number, and if Daniel Lynch is susceptible to giving up hard contact to the right side, I think you play some Tigers here. So this is kind of a gross game here, but they're popping very hard into betting markets so far today. Like, you got to lay $1.50 on them on the road, and they're popping north of five in any expected run total here. So they're not going to hit for a lot of power over the wall necessarily, and they're still going to strike out a little bit, but... They're going to make a lot of hard contact, very little soft. So it's medium and hard contact here. Um, I think this is an upside spot for the Tigers. You want to play some Eddie with them? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, but I think we could expect to see some offense here and a lot of contact because Eddie's still pitching to 78% here. So it's not like he's totally blowing it past everybody, even though the aggregate strikeout rate is, is elevated this season. So uh, I think you can play some Tigers. I think you can play some Royals. Eddie is in play as well. Probably no Daniel Lynch for me, but this is a, a 
fine tournament stack. You can get to full stacks. You get to filler stacks. I think it's all in play. Okay, Coors Field here. You got Yuri Perez on the mound. Uh, young kid for the Marlins. Um, 7,100. Don't think you can play this. He also, also throws a curveball. Also a good pitch for him. Also unlikely to break at Coors Field, as we talked about yesterday with Eddie Cabrera. Um, bad fastball, just like Eddie, Eddie Cabrera. Now, this is a super short sample. He's got velo, and he's got a good velo delta on the changeup to the four-seamer here. So this is all encouraging. Hard slider, 86+, plus, and a legit curveball at the 80-81. So um, this is a legit four-pitch arsenal here, and he's a very high upside prospect for them. That's why they're just letting him run. However, as with a, any young arm, there's a lot of variance. We are worried a little bit about command, getting ahead of hitters. Um, it's not translating to walk rate just yet, but uh, you know he's walked 10% of the 20 lefties that he's seen so far this season. Well, that's two walks, you know, so it's like whatever. Um, so we got to keep an eye on this, and we want to see the the strike, the first pitch strike rate drift up, certainly. Uh, but I think he's probably likely to struggle uh, a decent bit here um, because he, he relies a lot on this heavy breaking stuff here. Throws the curveball quite a bit. Doesn't throw the change up enough, and he's got a, you know, a, a vulnerable four-seamer if he's not spotting this yet. So can't really take anything else uh, all too notable out of out of the arsenal here and in the pitch mix or anything um so we just got to kind of see how he goes but it is a four pitch mix problem is he's a course field and he's 7100 so you can't really play him unfortunately uh you can get to some rocky stacks again as you could have last night and we as we kind of talked about um but man this offense is bad um to be frank uh austin gomer on the mound for them 5400 can't really play him either and you're gonna see heavy heavy ownership come to miami once again um they're coming in at about 15% in aggregate right now. And that's high on a, a full 10-game slate here. So I think you can play, however, today compared to yesterday, it's a much better spot for them, I think. Um, their righties are probably going to be able to feast on Austin Gomber here. He's really struggling. Pitching did way too much contact. Just a 15% aggregate K rate so far this year. 55% strike one for him. Zero chase. 8% swinging strike rate. And a CSW of 24% here. Um, now he's got four full pitches as well, and his changeup has been pretty equitable for him so far this season, and that's allowed him to survive in a start here or there, but this is a very bad matchup, giving up a lot of hard contact, is he, to both sides of the plate, in a short sample of the lefties, but, you know, 39%, 39%, and this is still a Coors Field, 231 ISO to the right side with a 360 Wobe and a 273 average allowed. Expected batted ball metrics, 310 XBA with a 397 X Woba and a 248 X ISO. Uh, 35% hard contact. No thank you. You're going to want to get to a lot of the Marlins and as much as you can. But once again, you just got to balance ownership. Georgie Soler, John Birdie, Gene Segura, pretty decent third base play here today, even though the ISO numbers are not really there for him. Uh, but they're going to go very right-handed heavy for you. Garrett Cooper, Brian De La Cruz, Yuli Gurriel might get a start at first base. Nick Fortes behind the plate. Garrett Hampson likely to be in there again, as will Peyton Burdick. So they could very well throw nine righties in this lineup here. Um, yeah, you're going to want to get to as much Miami as possible. Hard to stack outside of Birdie and maybe a Garrett Hampson. Those are the only two guys with multi-position eligibility. So you're going to have to figure out how to get different and be willing to play some of these guys down at the bottom of the lineup. But Peyton Burdick... At like a 2700, he makes for a fine wraparound play if you need to get there. Um, so it's just ownership that you got to balance with the Marlins tonight. Okay, Boston and the Angels, 6300 for Brian Bayo on the mound. Now I like this price tag for him. Um, the strikeout stuff is ticked up, 24% here. Not so much against lefties, but you know, shortish sample still here with just six starts uh, for Bayo. Um, swinging strike stuff is there, throwing a lot more strikes. The walk rate ticked up to a full 9%. He's got this well under control um, compared to where he was in, in previous seasons where he was, what, 16% or something? I mean, it was horrific. However, in his last start, ready for this? 
against Seattle, went five innings, struck out seven. That's great. Gave up one run, one run on just three hits. That's great, but he walked five batters in five innings. You cannot do this, and it's not totally eliminated yet. Even though he's got it under control, it's not 16 17% anymore. Uh, you can't walk that many people and expect to get away with suppression and things like that. So we've got a lot of noise coming in the ERA and the expected metrics here. You know, decent XFIP here, 375, but an XERA at 540 nearly. So quite a bit of noise there, and it sure, still a short sample. But the strike throwing and the swing strike, CSW is fine, pushing 27% here. We'd like to see this a little bit higher um, with the slider change mix. He needs to stay nice and, and down in the strike zone, but throw these for strikes. You still need to induce swing and miss and start these pitches as strikes. You want them to bail out of the strike zone late. So the secondary arsenal still needs a little bit of work here, and... He could get a little bit more swing and miss if he threw the four-seamer a little bit more and relied less on the two-seamer. Um, but overall, the the arsenal is encouraging with a, a fine and a balanced fastball mix with a fine and, and balanced secondary arsenal here. Really staying down in the strike zone with these two pitches, uh, but we need to induce more chase and get some more called strikes out of them. And that will increase the whiff rate to the lefties. And you can see the, the whiff rate um, or the strikeout rate, rather, pop north of 30% to the righties as well. So, so far, giving up way too much hard contact, though, because when he misses, it's still right on the barrel. 43% to the lefties, 37% to the righties. So I think these are attackable figures here. Are they going to regress? Yeah, probably. And do we care about that necessarily? Eh, not really, because he's getting so many ground balls here. 2.6 aggregate ground ball to fly ball. Really staying off of a line here. So I think this is a playable piece down here at 6,300 against the Angels. We saw Tanner How just tear them apart last night. And when Trout and Otani are swinging and missing at everything, this all of the upside for this entire lineup just goes out the window. Um, I think the only guy that did anything last night was Mickey Moniak. So maybe he's finally starting to realize his high upside prospect status. Um, you can still play the Angels because they still have Trout, Otani, and a very cheap Mickey Moniak up at the top. They still get a righty that's got some variance in him with walks, and he's pitched to a lot of hard contact here. They got some fly ball hitters, all three at the top of the lineup. Renfro, fly ball hitter. Jared Walsh, fly ball hitter. So it's a, a fine batted ball matchup going after Brian Bayo. I think I'd probably just side with him at 6,300, though. Um, I'm encouraged by where he is in, in his development here, and I think he'd take shots at this particular price. He's got upside for 20 and 22 here, and that's really all you need um, at 6,300. As you can see, our target price here, or target points, is just about 20. So uh, that's very attainable for Brian Bayo here, I think. Um, but you can play the Angels as well, as I mentioned. It's still a very high upside offense if they're not swinging and missing at everything. Griffin Canning on the mound, I'm not really thrilled about going after this. Uh, 6,800, I, I've rarely played Griffin Canning anymore. He's a fly ball pitcher, even though this season so far in his six starts, he's displaying a little bit more of a ground ball lean. Against the righties has really always been his, his problem. He's the four-seamer slider guy. He's staying down in the strike zone a little bit more since he's brought in the heavy usage of the changeup and the curveball. And that's inducing all of the ground balls here. Uh, but still to the right side, he's given up a lot of hard contact here so far. 43% with just a neutral ground ball to fly ball. That makes him very attackable. And we are seeing that sort of translate to a 1.7 homers per nine so far. Uh, it's just a 68 hitters and 16 innings against righties so far. But um, these numbers are probably where they're likely to end up if this arsenal kind of persists like this. And the values persist like this into the future here. Um, he's always been a fly baller, as I mentioned. He'll just have a, a slightly more ground ball lean um, with the heavier changeup usage. So it's okay if we want to play some Boston here, as we had alluded to earlier. They've got really elite numbers against right-handers. 20% strikeout rate, 181 ISO, some hard contact, and they'll get the baseball in the air to buck 20 ground ball to fly ball clip. I think this is, these are all very respectable numbers, very attackable. And also why we could have attacked some Jaime Berea last night, but, you know, he's got good stuff. I don't think Griffin Canning's got near the stuff, even that Jaime Barria does 
you know, for when he was throwing, what, four or five innings for the Angels. Um, I would like to get to some Boston tonight. We'll see how it shakes out. I would like to get there. I think this is a high upside spot for them. And positional flexibility really isn't there. So it makes them, you know, kind of easy and w- easy to stack in that regard. Hard to stack when they're popular because you can't get different. But when they're kind of off the board as they are a little bit here, uh, just kind of middling in both value and ownership here today so far, that makes them, like, you know where the product, most of the production is going to come from, right? It's going to come from Verdugo, Yoshida, Rafi Devers, Jaron Duran, for the most part, from the left side of the play. Justin Turner, sure, he's not going to strike out. you got to play him at first base, which really kind of stinks. Tristan Casas, like, you got to play him at just first base as well. So you got to make a choice there. Um, but I think this is an intriguing Boston stack. I would like to get to some of them tonight. We'll see how it, it shakes out. Um but I don't really want to play Griffin Canning pretty much at all. He throws a lot of strikes, and he pitches to a good bit of contact here, just a 19% aggregate K rate. Boston's not going to go right-handed heavy, and that's really, um, you know, in terms of raw strikeout stuff, the type of lineup that you want to target when playing Griffin Canning. But as I mentioned, he's given up a boatload of hard contact and a lot of power here. He's got a 195 X ISO to both sides of the plate here, and anything pushing 200 that's a very attackable figure so um i'd like to get to some boston maybe a little bit of the angels here tonight and probably some brian bayo as well okay last game here let's get through this as quickly as possible luis medina on the mound for the a's uh you could probably consider playing this price for him 5500 and going after a little bit of seattle but if you want to stack seattle again go ahead this is oakland they're starting pitching all season has been bad very attackable um and it's because mostly that they have trouble throwing strikes and walking people. They don't have a lot of chase in them. They don't really have a lot of upside in them. And Luis Medina, he's got a, a fine four-pitch mix here, but he's really struggling to get value so far out of the breaking arsenal. Uh, he's establishing okay. He's got a little bit of velo uh, at 95-97 here on, on the four-seamer. Uh, so that's fine. And really what's given him uh, a good bit of value so far as a four-seamer change. It, it's it's mostly kept him out of um, pretty significant trouble, but as we can see here with the uh, realized metrics in this very short sample here, um, the 314 Woba and a 200 average to lefties is fine, but a 267 ISO this is kind of a big number. 36 per, 36% hard contact, kind of a big number. Uh, a lot of ground balls so far, so that's that's fine, but very short sample. We can't really take a whole lot out of this just yet. But two encouraging outings uh, in his most recent starts against Arizona and Texas uh, survived and went a full six innings in each of those. He struck out six in his last outing. He did give up three runs, so there's going to be a little bit of variance here. I'd probably rather... Um, I, I think I'd much rather play a Bobby Miller at 5,200 than Luis Medina, for example. Um, but I think the matchup for Luis Medina is probably a little bit better, uh, than going after the Braves. I'd rather go after Seattle, 25% K rate here with a average WRC plus, just like the Braves. They're not going to hit for near as much power though. And basically similar in every other metric, um, is Seattle to Atlanta. So I think I'd rather just play Bobby Miller. I think his arsenal's better. He's got more upside. He's got more velo. So um, that's probably where I'd pivot, but 5,500 is a playable construction if you land on this and, and need this if you get to a very expensive stack elsewhere. So I think it's okay. He's got four pitches he can work with, but overall the, the strikeout stuff so far has been a little underwhelming. The chase is underwhelming. The swinging strike stuff is underwhelming. Um, so that's why I'd rather just go take shots on Bobby Miller. I think in a, in his first start, he's probably just got a little bit more upside. Uh, Marco on the other side for the Mariners, he's popping down here at 6,700. And, you know, if we only need 22 points out of the guy, well, Marco definitely has this in the tank in this particular matchup. Sure. The athletics, however, we talked about this all season, 110 WRC plus against lefties, 21 and a half percent K rate. They're not going to hit for a hell of a lot of power, just a 164 ISO, but it's it's above 150. It's a good number. Not a lot of hard contact, but they're mostly neutral ground ball to fly ball, so they'll hit it on the line here, and they're a little bit sticky. 
like an Asteria Ruiz at the top of the lineup. He's a very playable 3,500 still. Uh, Brent Rooker is very playable. Marco's not going to throw it past these guys. He's not going to throw it, you know, just strike out everybody, as we saw in his last outing when Boston really took it to him. He pitches to a lot of contact, throws strikes, and he throws it over the plate. He's got a very, very good changeup that could neutralize a lot of the right-handers from Oakland, however. Um, but they've got some guys here that don't really strike out a lot. Jesus Aguilar, um, Esuri Ruiz, he'll still whiff a little bit, but when he gets on base, uh, he's going to steal. And this is a lefty. He'll steal third base, too. So he's got a lot of upside in this particular matchup. Um, Shea's got a lot of upside here in this spot. Ramon Laureano's got a little bit, as does Brent Rooker, of course. So uh, you could play a couple Oakland pieces here as well. Now, Marco's not going to be very popular, so I'd probably just side with him and take shots that Oakland is just terrible and, and they're Oakland. Um, but he pitches to too much contact, and I like Oakland a little bit against lefties. So not thrilled about playing Marco here tonight, but he's popping the hardest of anybody in the 6K range, I think. Uh, and if we only need 22 out of him, like I said, you know, that's very well within range. So um, I think you could play, I think a lot of stuff is in play here. Not super jacked about stacking the Mariners. Uh, certainly not as, as much as last night, but uh, I think they're obviously in play once again because you can attack a low strikeout rate and vulnerable strike one rate with low chase, low swinging strike rate here. Uh, against Luis Medina it's the ground ball rate that we gotta you know keep an eye on with him but he's been on the barrel and given up some hard contact here so far so I think this is attackable for sure and Oakland's bullpen is dreadful so uh, yeah go ahead if you want to stack the Mariners okay that's it I think we went kind of long here today so sorry about that guys uh, let's go over stacks quickly Baltimore and the Yankees Yankees are all right here um, not super thrilled about going after Kyle Bradish mostly because of their pricing but I think you can play a couple real shrewd deep tournament pieces um, and target some, you know, you're just homer hunting against Garrett Cole. I don't really want to stack against him, but when he's bad, he can be really bad. Um, and he hasn't quite put up a, a real big stinker yet this season. So it, it's within range with a very good offense over here. A well, well down the list, however, of course, San Diego and Washington don't really want offense here necessarily either. I respect both of these arms. My favorite would be Darvish, of course, but I think Mackenzie Gore's in play. Despite a very high price tag, I'm really not jacked about that. Um, Dodgers and Atlanta, uh, offense is certainly in play here from Al Atlanta's perspective. Uh, you can, of course, play Strider. It's just a price tag and an ownership thing that you got to balance there. And you can target Bobby Miller on the other side making his debut. I'd rather just side with him because he's cheap and he makes a lot of things work. You can get to some very chalky and expensive offenses elsewhere. Bobby Miller unlocks that for you. He's got a lot of upside, this kid. Very, very big arm. Houston and Milwaukee. Like to get to Houston again. Maybe a couple Milwaukee pieces. No pitching on the mound here tonight, I don't think. Maybe a JP France, but like, ugh. He just doesn't have the K stuff. I don't know. Um, uh, I'm okay with Milwaukee. I think this is fine. San Francisco and Minnesota. I don't really want pitching, or excuse me, offense here either. I like Alex Cobb a little bit and some Sonny Gray for sure. I think this game in particular really depends on the lineup construction that both San Francisco and the, and the Twins release that will really dictate uh, how we want to, or how much exposure we want to get to either of these guys, but both of them very well in play offense and eh, not so much. I like the Mets here a little bit against Drew Smiley. I think he's in play at a, uh, a playable price tag, 7,300 down here, but um, not my favorite going after the Mets. I just don't, go after them usually, even though this offense just really stinks. Could I sing on the mound? Like, he just walks too many people, man. But you could play him if you really want to get different and, like, play correlated bet stacks or something like that. Like, the strikeout rate is there. That's undeniable. It's just a walk rate that's super frustrating. Detroit and Kansas City, I like this game for tournaments. Um, you can they, These two teams make a lot of hard contact, and I think both of these arms are attackable. Certainly Daniel Lynch more so than Eddie Rodriguez. I think he's in play on the mound as well. Uh, but I like a little bit of offense here, and I kind of like the Tigers. Um, Miami and Colorado, definitely Miami against Austin Gomber here tonight. And I think you play Colorado too, going after a young arm, making his first start at Coors Field. He throws a curveball, so yeah, let's go after it. Uh, Boston and L.A., I like Boston here a pretty decent bit against against Griffin Canning tonight. No Canning on the mound for me. Brian Bayo in correlated stacks, I think this is fine. You can play him at 6,300 too. There's, there's upside there. And Oakland, Seattle, yeah, Seattle, sure, uh, going after another young arm here and a bad bullpen. 
But I think Oakland is also in play against Marco. He pitches to way too much contact for DFS purposes. Uh, so that's it. So keep an eye out for projections and ownership pushes. As always, we will um, have lineups trickling in here in the next several hours. So keep an eye out. We'll push updates as, as often as we can. And so good luck, everybody, on this Big Tuesday 10-gamer.